Hi, and welcome to our series on the automatic transmission. This tape will deal strictly with Chrysler 727 torque flight. Now we'll take apart each piece of this transmission and look at all the parts carefully and reassemble it. But some of the things we won't be covering in this tape are how to remove and replace the transmission in your vehicle. And you'll need a manual, whether it covers many makes and models, or better yet, one that covers your specific make and model to help guide you as you remove and replace that transmission safely. And a real nice feature about owning the manual is it'll help you out with in-car adjustments, which you'll definitely need when you put that transmission back in, and how many quarts that transmission will take as you fill it back up. And as with any project like this, be sure to use your most important tool when working on this. And these are your safety goggles and really, be sure to wear them. This transmission has been very popular for Chrysler throughout the years. They started using this way back in 1962, and they're still running variations of the same transmission today. To identify the bell housing, if we're looking at a small block bell housing, it'll have a flat on this side of the case, where the big block would be rounded in this area. So the small block is the one with the flat on this side. As we start our disassembly, I'll be marking all the bolts we're taking out with these colored dots to keep it simple and you know exactly what we're working on. We want to start by removing the six tail housing bolts and then the two Phillips head screws located on the bottom or the side of the tail housing. Underneath the plate and gasket you'll remove is a snap ring. Using a pair of snap ring pliers, just spread the snap ring and lift the tail housing off. Now you'll want to remove the pan bolts, the pan, and the gasket. And now the three filter screws and the filter itself. Before we remove the valve body, make sure any linkage has been removed from the outside of the case. And now is a good time to take off our neutral safety switch. Be sure to use a socket on this only. Now we can safely take out all the valve body bolts. As you lift your valve body off, you'll want to watch underneath here for the spring. It's easy to lose. Now we'll loosen the reverse band lock nut and back the stud right out of the case. And we want to do the same with the second gear adjusting nut and the screw. And now I'll remove the band struts on the second gear band, starting with the one on this end, and then the one here. Now I want to remove all the bolts holding the pump in. Next, I want to stand the transmission up on its bell housing. And if I have a flexible second gear band here, I'll work it and slide it up around the sun gear drum, something like that. Now on the output shaft, using the correct pair of snap ring pliers, I want to remove the snap ring and the bearing and the snap ring located underneath that bearing. On our governor housing, you'll need to remove the small E-clip using a screwdriver on this end and careful not to lose the clip and then pull the shaft with the valve right out the back side of that governor. With the small valve and shaft out of the way, we'll want to remove the snap ring on top of the governor assembly itself. Now this enables us to remove the entire governor assembly then. Now using a plastic mallet, I want to tap right on the output shaft and all we're trying to accomplish here is a simple way to remove this front pump. It doesn't get any easier than this. Now the front pump and the two drums are the first to come out. And here's my pump right here. And next is my forward and direct drums. This be my direct or third gear clutch drum 
right off the top, and then my forward clutch drum and the input shaft. Now removing the front pump and all the guts like that is really easy when we're disassembling the entire unit. But if we're just working on the front pump, you may want to use a set of slide hammers. There are two threaded bolt holes, and we'll thread a slide hammer in each side and then just pull the pump using the hammers. With the pump and drums removed, next is our second gear band, slides right out. Then our rear planetary set. Pushing on the output shaft, we should be able to guide this all the way out. Still in the case is our low reverse drum, and that'll slide right out. Now the reverse band is still held in by the band strut. So you'll want to push on this side of the band until the strut comes loose. Or get a screwdriver in between the strut here and push it over. Now you'll have to turn the band and don't lose your strut. And then the band slides right out the front. The low roller clutch still has to come out of the bottom of the case. So use a pair of needle nose pliers and just grab the race and bring the race out. Now you have to collect all the springs and rollers. On the rear of the case, remove the four bolts holding the output shaft support and slide the support out. In the bottom of our case is still our accumulator and our servos. And the accumulator should just pull right out of the case. For the second gear servo, you'll want to use a thin bladed screwdriver to remove the snap ring on top of the piston. Once you've gotten the snap ring loose, it should just pull right out with your hand. Now careful, underneath this is a powerful spring holding our cover on. At the bottom of the bore is still our servo piston. Our reverse servo starts the same way. Use your screwdriver again and remove the snap ring. And careful because there's a nice spring behind this one too. And then the spring retainer, the spring, and at the bottom of the bore is the piston again. So we've got our case empty and we need to tear down some more of these parts for our careful inspection. And we'll start by tearing down our pump. We need to remove the six bolts that hold the two halves together. Now lift off the back or stator half of the pump. And this is what we call a stator, so we refer to this as a stator half. And then we can lift out the pump gears. But before I do that, I'd like to mark my pump gears. Now I'll do this just using a screwdriver and put a small line through the gears to the outside edge. This will tell me how to match the gears when I put them back in. To remove the front seal, what I like to do is use a large screwdriver and get behind the seal in the pump and just use my hammer to tap it right out. This assembly of our direct or third gear clutch drum starts with the snap ring on top here and just use a screwdriver, get underneath the snap ring and remove it. Turning the drum upside down, we want to remove all the clutches and the pressure plate. The thick one being the pressure plate, and the others being the clutches and the steels. Next, we'll need to remove this snap ring from the spring retainer here, and we'll need a tool to help us do that. And here it is, our universal clutch spring compressor. You'll see it in quite a few of our videos, and it works on a lot of different transmissions. And here's how we use it. We'll snap the one shoe into the snap ring groove. Push and make sure we seat the other shoe firmly into the snap ring groove. Then we'll adjust the small pads to the width of the snap ring retainer. Now this is what it looks like when it's all properly installed. I turn down the center screw, taking the pressure off the snap ring. When I've turned it far enough, I can use my snap ring pliers and remove the snap ring. Now it's just a matter of taking the tension back off and removing the tool.
Now we have our spring retainer and the springs. Notice how they're evenly spaced. And under that is our piston, which should lift right out of the drum. When we have all these parts out, the direct drum is disassembled. Our forward clutch drum and shaft is even simpler. All we'll need is a small screwdriver. And I like to have a hole in my bench just to make it simple. I set the clutch upside down. And like our direct clutch, we remove the top snap ring, the thick pressure plate, all the clutches and steels. And this one has a pressure plate even on the bottom. Now we call this a forward clutch simply because it's used in all forward gears, not because of its location. Next, we'll locate the snap ring here. And again, use a small screwdriver, peel it out of place. Underneath that is a spacer. Could be plastic or it could be steel. And then our piston return spring. And inside here is our piston. Now we can lift off our input shaft. The one item we still have left is our planetary gear sets and our output shaft. This setup is pretty basic. All we'll need is a pair of snap ring pliers. Take the snap ring off the end of the output shaft here. And don't forget any thrust washers that may be on the end of the shaft. We can pull the front planet assembly. That's the ring gear and the planet carrier here. Next is a sun gear shell, slides right off. The rear planet carrier and the rear ring gear. At this point, we've tore down our entire transmission with the exception of our valve body and governor. And we'll wanna take time now to go through and carefully inspect all these parts because they're all gonna have to work to have a successful transmission rebuild. And we'll start with our output shaft. With this shaft, some of the things I'm most concerned about is the bushing surfaces. This is where the bushing of our other rotating piece rides all along here, and the splines themselves. Now to check these bushing surfaces, I could use a straight edge. But because they are such small surfaces, it really makes it difficult. So what I like to use is about some three to 400 grit emery paper. And what we'll do is lightly sand the bushing areas across this way. And what we're looking at is the shaft with little or no wear. When I dressed it across the surface, and remember, we're just lightly dressing these pieces, there are no large grooves or dips in these surfaces at all. They're nice and uniform. Now here's a look at a same shaft out of another transmission. And you can see how we highlighted it here, all the deep grooves we have in this bushing surface. Now think of this just as any crankshaft in any engine. It needs a wide bushing surface to support the shaft and to get the oil where it needs to go. So check these surfaces carefully. For checking the splines, I'll look at them carefully and I wanna make sure the splines are the same thickness from the front all the way to the rear. I'll check all these carefully. Also our speedometer drive gear. Make sure this area isn't chewed up and it's nice and smooth. One other part I'm really concerned about is the holes along this shaft. They're all fed from the end here. I want to take my blow nozzle and blow air through here and make sure I have air coming out each hole. This is my lubrication here. I have to make sure that I don't have any debris stuck in these holes. And again, on the output splines, I want to check these carefully from front to rear. Next is my low reverse drum. And I want to check the lugs. They should look like this, nice and clean, not rounded off or chewed up. Next, I want to check the band surface here. Any scarring or dark marks could be a problem. And I can check this. Usually, I'll use something a little heavier, like a 150 grit, to make sure it's nice and straight across this area. 
I can also use a straight edge here. On the inside, I want to carefully check the splines here for wear and check the bushing surface in here. By using the emery again, I've checked the inside of the bore and I can see a couple scratches, but overall, this has a nice support area and I'm not afraid to use that. Now I have two drums here because I want to do a comparison. Take a look at the color inside this drum. Now I've cleaned this drum, so this is not dirt. This is the actual color of the steel. What that means is this band slid enough to change the color of the steel. This drum has been too hot and I don't want to use it. The main reason is this surface here tends to be hardened and the band needs a soft surface to grab. Now when you inspect the drum for where the band rides, don't be afraid of a little color like this drum here. This color is just transfer from using that band. Notice the heat spot here on this one. But this color is normal as long as this surface is fairly flat. We'll still use this drum, so don't be afraid of it. Next up is our rear ring gear and thrust washer. And the thrust washer is just simply a piece of steel with the splines on the inside. Check the splines carefully on the inside and make sure this is nice and smooth and not discolored. We can always flip this over if we need a smoother surface. We'll have to check the teeth carefully all the way around on this one and the splines on the inside here. Now to check the teeth on the inside of the ring gear, you'll have to look closely and check the teeth for any wear. Now we have a small mark here, but that's just a wear in pattern and I can't even feel it here with my scribe. But you want to check this whole area for any lifting of the material or any pitting and check both sides of the teeth carefully all the way around. Next is our rear planet carrier. And this has a thrust washer that sits on top and it may be a three tab like this one or a four depending on how many pinion pins we have in this carrier. The thrust washer should be good color, no large scratches. This is a good example of a nice thrust washer. To check the planetary carrier, check the lugs on the outside to make sure they're in good shape as this one is. And we'll need to carefully check the teeth on all the gears. Again, just like the ring gear, check both sides of the teeth and check this all the way around. The other thing we're concerned about is how much play is in that gear. So we'll want to look at the washers, like this one that sits underneath it, make sure it's thick, as this one is. These gears need some movement to keep their lubrication, but make sure this is not an excess. The other check I want to do is inside here are needle bearings that this rolls on. So try to rock the gear. Make sure that gear does not rock. You also need to check the obvious. Make sure the color of the pins are like this. And we don't have any blue worn out pins or missing retaining pins sitting in here. This area here is a thrust washer surface. So make sure this is flat and smooth. Our next piece is a sun gear and shell. Again, you have to check the teeth on the gear, both sides of this gear, carefully. This one has a three tab thrust washer. The tabs on the washer sit into the holes of the sun shell. And be sure to check this. Again, we need smooth and good color. We also need to check the lugs on the shell itself. Notice on this one how it's worn into the edge here. It should be nice and straight like this side. So check all the lugs on this drum carefully. On the back side of the shell, you want to check this thrust plate. Make sure it's smooth and flat. We need to run a thrust washer against it. And make sure your snap ring here is intact. And on this piece, there are several lubrication holes. And you'll want to check and make sure that these are free of debris. And they're all around this gear on this side and the opposite side. Our front planet ring gear is similar to our rear in the fact that we want to check the teeth on the inside here like we did on the rear one carefully, all the teeth, and then we'll check the teeth out here. These we check just like splines. Let's make sure they're nice and uniform from front to rear. There's no big gouges dug into this set. 
This area here is a thrust washer surface. So let's make sure this is smooth and flat. On the back side is also a thrust washer surface. So check this to make sure it's smooth and flat. And this surface, again, we can even use the emery paper and check it as we did the output shaft. You also need to pay attention to this surface area in here. This is much like a bushing surface. It needs to be smooth and straight. This helps guide our front planetary carrier into the center of our ring gear. Next up is our front planet carrier. We'll need to check the splines inside here. Check all the gears and their teeth individually. Don't forget to check the washers on each side, how much play, and do the wiggle test. On the back side of the carrier, I have a three-tab thrust washer that sits on there like that. Now notice the dark areas on this. This is a perfect example of a thrust washer that got too hot. And this isn't one I want to use. This area here should be flat to support that thrust washer. Again, be sure to check your pins and their retainers. This surface here was a bushing surface we were talking about that helps center our ring gear. So make sure this is straight and smooth. Our forward clutch parts are next, and we'll start with our forward clutch drum. On the top side of our drum sits a thrust washer. And this is just a nylon flat thrust washer. And we'll want to check carefully the splines on the end here. Again, check those for uniform thickness all the way through. And this bushing surface here, which is really important to support this shaft. And of course, the surface under the thrust washer, make sure this is flat and smooth. Check the teeth all on the outside. Make sure these are in nice shape. And we don't have any deep grooves in the set. On the inside is where our piston rides. So I'll we'll check the bore on the outside and the inside and make sure we have no large scratches. Also, this area here is a thrust washer surface on this particular model. Be sure that this is smooth and flat. And of course, we have a lube hole that's fed through the back here. So make sure this is free from debris. On the forward clutch piston, check this surface to make sure it's smooth. It needs to be rounded, but it needs to be smooth, no jagged edges. Check for any obvious cracks. And also, we have a check ball here. Rattle the piston. Make sure that check ball moves freely. Our clutch retaining drum is fairly simple. Make sure the snap ring groove's in good shape. Make sure the lugs all the way around are in good shape and the splines on the inside. Our spacer that sits on top of the return spring is usually plastic, sometimes steel. Make sure it's in good shape and not melted. And the return spring, check for any cracks all the way around. On the snap rings, make sure they're not broken. And yes, the bottom one is a waved one, and the top is a flat one. For the pressure plates, both the bottom and top, make sure they have good color as these do, and make sure they're nice and smooth. Our direct clutch parts are next, and we'll start with our drum here. And first, we need to check this surface. For a thrust washer, this needs to be straight and smooth. The outside bore the piston here. Make sure we have no large scratches, and the same with the inside. Check the lugs on the outside here for wear, and the lugs on the inside. Make sure the snap ring groove is in good shape. Now this drum, like our forward clutch piston, has a check ball in it. So rattle the drum, make sure that ball moves freely. On the side, check the band surface here. Make sure it's straight across and smooth. Do not sand this area. On the front, this area here is a thrust washer surface also. On the inside of the drum, two rings need to ride in this area. And I use my sandpaper to check to make sure the grooves are not deep at all around this area or the rings can't seal. Then I'll take my sandpaper and put a nice crosshatch pattern 
for the new rings to seed in. But I need to check this area carefully all the way around. I'll check my snap ring for any obvious problems. Check the springs to make sure they're not bent. I can always roll them across the tabletop to determine this. Make sure I have no broken springs. And the retainer for any obvious problems. For the piston, I want to check for any obvious cracks. Also, the lugs on here should be in good shape. And carefully check the bore inside here for any wear. This should be nice and smooth and straight. The snap ring and pressure plate should also be checked. Again, this is a waved or slightly waved snap ring, as you can see. And check for color on the pressure plate. This is very important. No hot or dark spots. Next up is our pump, and we'll start that off with our stator half. The pump is an extremely important piece of this transmission, so be sure to check it very carefully. This surface here must be flat. You may want to check it with a straight edge. It's a good way to do it. We could sand the surface and check for large scratches, but it must be flat across this area. Check the splines here for wear all the way down them. On the back side, check the thrust washer surface under this thrust washer, this bushing surface here. Don't be afraid to sand it lightly and check it carefully. In the back half, inside here, we have two rings that ride just past the bushing. You'll need to sand and check this area also. Some of the late model units in the rear of the pump here uses a ring and won't have a big recessed hole here. If yours uses a ring, it will be machined all the way across here. And be sure to check that surface. But all the earlier units have a large hole here, and nothing needs to be checked. On the pump gears, check the face for any large scratches and the back side of the gears. Also, be sure to check the outside diameter for any large scratches. Inside, check the lugs and make sure they're in good shape. Our converter drives the pump on these two lugs. Also, check for any wear in this area. Check next to the lug for any deep grooves or marks. Make sure this is nice and smooth all the way around. And the hub of the converter has not worn into the inside of these gears. To check the front pump half, I want to make sure that the vent here isn't broken and in good shape. This area here must be in great shape. No scratches or large grooves. The same with the bottom surface. This must be straight all the way across. No scratches or large grooves. I like to check to see how tight my pump gears fit. To do this, I'll just use an ordinary notebook piece of paper, something with lines on it. Now this is about 3 thousandths thick. I should be able to fit the pump gear in and pull that piece of paper out. But here's the trick. If I double that piece of paper and stick it in alongside there, I shouldn't be able to install that gear. If I can, either the gear or the body is worn too much. To check for wear on my gears to see if they've worn in or worn thin, I can check that gear height. And here's how I do it. Using the front planet ring gear, I'll set it on there and pick a good center. I'll use my piece of paper, slide it underneath there, push down hard on the ring gear, and try to pull that piece of paper out. If I push hard enough, it should just rip the end of the paper off. That tells me that the clearance on these gears are less than 3 thousandths. I like to see it around 2 thousandths. So if it doesn't rip the paper off, you better be looking for another pump. Now, I hope you realize that when we do this top measurement, that the paper sits only on top of those pump gears, not out onto the pump itself. So make sure you take that measurement only on top of the pump gears. And yes, you have to really push down on this. Next is our output shaft support. And we'll need to check this carefully in this area where the low reverse drum rides. And again, you can use your sandpaper. Check it for any large scratches or wear. As the band applies on this drum, it likes to wear into it. Also, check inside here. 
be sure to use some sandpaper. The output shafts like to wear into this area. In the back, two rings need to ride in this area. Be sure to check it and crosshatch dress it. For our low roller clutch in a race, you need to check the splines and check the top and bottom surface for large scratches. On the face here, we need to again take our emery paper. I keep calling it sandpaper, but again, we're using about 300 grit emery paper. And I want to dress this up all the way around to help oil it. And at this time, we want to check for any large grooves or scratches. Notice that one there and these here. This one's unacceptable. We want this to be straight up and down and smooth all the way around. On our second gear servo, we want to check the obvious. Most of them have a large spring and a top cover. We'll check for wear inside the top cover. Make sure the spring's in good shape. On the later model ones, we have a two-piece piston. Use our snap ring pliers. Pull this snap ring out of the top and take off the snap ring, the retaining plate, and then we have a spring here. Make sure this is in good shape. And then pull the piston out. You'll need to replace this ring with the one in your kit, but check this shaft on the piston here for wear, and the bore inside the piston itself for wear. Then you'll want to reassemble it with the new O-ring just as we took it apart. In your kit, you should also find the new steel outer rings that fit on the pistons here. Now these just pry open to get off, and you'll just have to pop the new ones apart to get it on. And these should all be in your kit. So you'll want to match them up and replace both the ring on here and both rings on this one. On our reverse piston, again, check the spring here and the inner spring here. Make sure the clip is intact on the bottom side here and remove the lip seal and replace it with the new one in your kit. Now this seal, the lip will face down when you replace it. Now the accumulator we took out of the case, ours used a spring on top. Not all of them have it. But if you have this spring, check it, make sure it's in good shape. And find the rings in the kit and replace them on the accumulator. Some heavy duty models had a spring that actually fit right into the end of this accumulator. Most models you'll find a bearing on the output shaft and be sure to check the bearing for any wear. Check for pits in around the, both the races and the balls and lightly oil this bearing. Our reverse band inspection is fairly simple. We want to make sure the lining has a good color and no dark black stripes to it like this one. Now some of these came as a darker color. We'll take a close look at these. Now we're looking at a really good band here, but the lining from the factory comes fairly dark. So what we need to check for is any chipping along the edges of the band, any large pieces lifting out of the band. And this should not be black. It can be dark brown, but it cannot be black. For our second gear band, it may have came as a rigid type, like this one here that's all preformed, or it may be more of a flexible type like this one here. And these are interchangeable, so it's not a problem. Now basically the same rules apply for this band, like the reverse band. The lining can't be black. Check the edges here for wear or pieces falling off. And check the entire lining for any pieces falling out of it. We want the most gripping power we can out of these bands, so make sure they're in good shape. And our next piece is our case. We'll start our inspection with the dowel pin holes. Now there's two holes in this case that line up on the dowel pins of the engine to center line the engine and the transmission. So check these holes, make sure they're the same diameter from the front all the way through to the back. Now the outer race to the low roller clutch is still in the case and stays there. We'll first check the tin, 
that's connected to this. And what it is, is we want to check the posts to make sure they're not bent and they're in good shape. And we're also concerned with the backing plate here where the rollers have to ride. Now some digging in is normal. But if this gets chewed up too bad, our rollers can't move. So just use your scribe and make sure it's smooth across there, even though it's dug in some. The next piece we have to check is the ramp here. The rollers lodge against this to lock the race. And make sure this is smooth. Again, use your pick and feel. Make sure that none of these are worn so much that that roller cannot slide against there smoothly. We also need to check the bores on the case. So check all these bores, both the top and the bottom bore, for any large scratches or gouges. Check all three of these all the way around. I like to use a little scotch brite or something and clean them up. That way I can check. If they're just small scratches, I can live with it. But if it's a deep groove, I need to replace the case. Another piece that needs our attention on this case is a pin that runs through our linkage for our reverse band. And we'll need to use a scribe or something, get underneath here to push this pin up so we can get a hold of it and pull it out. And what we're after here is the O-ring on the end of the pin. You'll need to find the new one in your kit, match it up, install it on the shaft, put plenty of petroleum jelly on it, then reinstall the pin into the case. Up to this point, you've noticed that we've done no bushing inspection, and there's a good reason for that. These bushings need to be replaced to get all these parts to run back on the center line they were designed for. Now, the bushing kit itself is fairly inexpensive, but the tools to install these bushings are really expensive. What I recommend is buy the kit and have a local transmission shop install the bushings. Now these guys have the experience to set all those bushings at the correct depth so that they work properly. And believe me, this investment is well worth it. Next, we'll move on to our valve body, and on this we'll do a complete disassemble, we'll clean it up, and reassemble it, making sure all the parts work. On late model transmissions, because we have a clutch inside the converter that locks up, called our lockup clutch, or a locking converter. We'll have an auxiliary valve body here that controls that lockup. We need to start by removing those three screws and taking off that auxiliary valve body if this is a late model transmission. Next, on all valve bodies, we'll need to remove the screws holding the two halves of the valve body together. Before I lift off the bottom half of my valve body, I'll use a screwdriver and bend slightly the spring retainer. This gives me a little more room to get this cover off. And you'll notice most our check balls are located in the top half here. So you'll want to be careful because they're easy to lose as you pull the two pieces apart. As you remove these, you may want to use a scribe and mark the holes that the check ball was removed from. This may help you as you put it back together. Now, because we're covering so many different years, sometimes it's very helpful to have a shift kit for this transmission. It'll show you exactly where they want you to put these pieces. For example, in this corner, I have a check ball with a spring underneath it. So keep track of all these pieces. Next, on the bottom half of the valve body, we'll need to remove the screws that hold the plate to the body itself. Sometimes we'll find screws in this area, but ours uses four screws at these locations. Now, as you lift your plate off, again, be careful. It is possible to find check balls in this half, usually in this area or down in this area. Some models also used a plastic nylon filter that sat in this location. If yours is missing or broken, it's okay to leave it out. The next piece we want to remove on our top half of the valve body is the spring retainer itself. And usually we'll find a screw on top here and one down at the base here. As this piece comes off, you'll notice there's some pretty good spring tension behind it. So be careful not to lose any pieces. And let's start a good habit. As these pieces come out of the valve body, lay them out on a clean shop towel just in the same order you're taking them out. And it goes the same with the valves. 
we need to keep all this in order as we go. And this is crucial to putting this back together the right way. And here's a look at the valve lineup from the valves underneath the retainer. Notice this one here has a sleeve that slides out. The largest holes in the back side of that sleeve. And yours should look similar to this. Next, we'll want to remove the rooster comb here, and this will take a little bit of work. The detent ball and spring is held in by a pin. And at the factory, they peen over a little bit of aluminum to hold that pin in. So I need to use a scribe or something fairly sharp to remove any aluminum around the top of that pin. This is where the work comes in, but it makes it a lot easier to disassemble. Now using a needle nose pliers, I can easily push the pin right out through the top. Now you want to put your thumb over the hole to catch the spring. Now to remove the rest of the linkage, I'll remove the E-clip here on top, and then the washer underneath that, and the rooster comb will lift off. And notice there's a seal on the top here you'll need to replace. You'll have to get the new one out of your kit and match it up. You also need to check the linkage pieces. Our TV rod should be free from rust and in good shape. On the rooster comb, check to make sure the center is tight. Notice how loose this one is. This could present a real problem. Also, check for fit in the valve body. Set it in there and notice how much play you have. A loose fit here can sometimes be caused by a worn out rooster comb. Notice the big lip worn on this one edge. The spring continually pushes against this side and easily wears this steel piece out. And carefully take a look at the park rod. Make sure the spring in here is in good shape and that the rod actually moves against that spring. And we want to be aware of this end. Way down here where the park engages, we have to make sure this is nice and smooth across this end. No deep gouges in this area at all. And also the ramp here should be nice and smooth. And check this all the way around. Now I'll remove my manual valve and also the six screws that hold on my cover plate. Next, I'll remove the two screws and plate and pull the valves out of this area here. And then the three screws, the plate, the small body here, and the valves. And here's what my valve lineup looks like. Underneath the small plate, I had a sleeve, a small round valve, and then another valve following that. And yours should be similar to this. Underneath our other plate, I had the small valve body with one valve in it and one valve that came out the side with the retainer, and then three large valves and springs on the inside. Next, I'll remove the five screws that hold our last cover on. And here's a look at the valve lineup under this plate. It's fairly simple, just three valves and one spring. Now there's only one valve left, and it's easy to remove. Just use a scribe, remove the E-clip off the end of the valve here, and you'll have to push the valve out the front. Then remove the spring and the two spring seats. Now not all valves want to come out as easy as we've shown. And this is where a pick comes in handy. This is just a scribe with a straight end and a 90 on the other end. Now I can get behind the valves and actually push them out of the bore. Now I want to be careful not to scratch the bore, but I should be able to get a hold of valves enough to slowly move them out. When it's out far enough, I can usually just pull the valve out. But work these out gently. Now here's a look at my valve body all disassembled. And notice how it's all laid out just the way it came out. There's going to be no mistakes the way I put this back together. I don't have to worry if that valve went in this way, the spring that way. I've laid it all out, and it makes a nice, easy roadmap to follow as I put it back together. Now, for cleaning this entire valve body, it should be really simple. What I like to do is work in a well-ventilated area, 
and I'll use a can of spray carburetor cleaner. This is usually just some choke or carb cleaner. And I want to spray down each individual valve, all the springs, all the plates, and even my screws, and the body assembly itself. Now I want to spray this down thoroughly, and if I'm using the right carb cleaner, it'll take off any of the black soot on all the valves and all the small cracks and crevices here. Now this stuff is really nasty, and it's nothing you really want to play around with. You need the adequate ventilation and good eye protection if you're going to do this. But the benefit is this. After it sits for about an hour, you'll come back and this stuff evaporates. So everything's nice and dry and clean to be reassembled. Now when I'm sure this is absolutely clean, and I want to start reassembling it, I want to put the valves in the bores without any springs. And I just want to check to make sure that valve travels freely in the bore. It should move nice and smooth like this. It should literally fall right out of the bore. If it doesn't, here's some ways to loosen that valve up. Find out where the valve sticks in the bore. If it happens to stick at this end, use a plastic screwdriver handle off a large screwdriver and wrap on the valve body surface. And we can flip it over and do the same on the back side. And then I want to recheck my valve. If it was sticky when it was pushed all the way in, but now moves freely, but as it comes out, it begins to stick. Then I'll leave the valve where it sticks again and repeat the same process. So you tried our first method, and the valve still doesn't seem like it moves very free in the bore. What you'll need to do is check it with a thumbnail. On the shiny areas here, which are the high spots of the valve, get on the very edge and rotate the valve. Feel for any high spots or burrs, and you can check each of these lands of the valve. If you find one, take a small file, and you want to run it only across that area where the burr is, nothing more. Dress only that area. Now, we don't want to sand this valve. We don't want to sand the bore. We're interested in just removing any burrs. And we can do this on all the lands, and then recheck it in the bore. And if we have to, we'll use the screwdriver one more time to clean it up. Now here's the valve layout on the late model lockup auxiliary valve body. The little piece we talked about in the beginning. If you have a lockup converter, this is your layout, and they're all the same. When you're happy with all the valves and how they move freely, to tighten all these screws, all you need is a small screwdriver, and these need to be hand tightened. If you have an inch pound wrench, tighten these to 32 inch pounds. As you reassemble your rooster comb and your linkage, don't forget that this still has to hook into the manual valve and move it freely. Also, for the TV linkage here, it sits between the stop and pushes on the valve there. Now, because of the way we disassembled our detent on the rooster comb, it's real simple to put back in. Put the ball, then the spring, and use a small screwdriver to push the spring in and then replace the pin. Now what you'll need to do too is pin this across the top with the small screwdriver and the tap of a hammer. As we reassemble the bottom half of our valve body, to hold the separator down, we have a hold down plate here. On 71 and later, when we don't have the auxiliary valve body here, it used a plate like this and sits just like that. That's how it's screwed down. On the earlier models, you'll find a plate like this, and it should sit in there just like that. Before you tighten it down, line up of this separator plate is important. Use one of the long valve body screws and set it in the hole back here to help, and then visually line it up. When you're satisfied with where the plate is, and we can see through all the bolt holes, then snug these up, and then hand tighten again or torque these. When you're sure that all your check balls are in the correct locations, assemble the two halves and hand start all the screws here. This is for alignment. Before you tighten any down, hand start all of them. 
and screws will not go in these three holes. These are left out to hold the filter on with different style screws. Now one valve body alone looks pretty rough, doesn't it? There's a lot of pieces, they all have to move. But this is really the heart of this transmission. One valve sticks and we'll have bad results. So take your time. There's a lot of pieces here. Lay out a good road map, keep everything very clean, and put it back together with some confidence. One piece to still be disassembled is our governor and the support. There's the four bolts holding the two together. Just take these out. Now some models, like the one we're working on, has a steel retainer that locks the bolt. You have to use a small chisel or screwdriver and pry the retainer back before you take the bolt out. Now as you lift the governor off, you have to be careful. This valve is just sitting in there and can fall right out. But under some models, you'll find a filter at one of these locations. It'll be recessed in the governor housing to fit it in there. This is about an inch tall filter and you can't miss it. To inspect our support, we want to check the teeth on the outside here. These are in really nice shape in this example. And yours need to be nice and clean like this. The park locks into this to keep your vehicle from rolling. So make sure these are in good shape. Check the splines on the inside here carefully. On the back side are two rings that need to be replaced. Find the ones in your kit that match these and make sure they spin freely when you install them. Here's a look at our valve layout on our governor. The weight here consists of a smaller weight and a spring inside. That's held in by the small snap ring and the entire weight is held in by the larger snap ring. The same rules apply for this valve as any other. Make sure these valves are clean and move freely. As you reassemble the governor, these bolts need to be torqued to 100 inch pounds. If you don't have a steel retainer for it, you should be using some type of thread locker on the threads. On the tail housing, I like to inspect the parked linkage located right here. And what we're looking for here is to make sure that the parking arm itself has a nice edge to it to catch into that governor support. And this one does. The second thing I want to look for is this piece here. Our park rod slides against this to engage our parking arm. Make sure this isn't chewed up and has a nice edge like this one. Yes, we managed to check every hard part in this transmission. And you'll need to do this carefully. One missed part could be a failure. Now we went out and purchased a master kit. Let's take a look at some of our parts. Now this kit gives us all the gaskets we'll need, all the new clutches and steels, and also all the rubber seals we'll need inside that transmission. A new front and rear seal, and the pump washers used to seal them front pump bolts. Some of the extras I've got is a filter for it, a full ring kit, all the steel rings inside that transmission, and some end play washers. These come in different thicknesses, so we can adjust the end play when we get to that point. I want to start my reassembly by replacing the shift shaft seal, which is on the back side of here. Just using a screwdriver, I want to get behind the lip and onto the metal clad seal, and then just tap it out with my hammer. Now to install my new seal, I've taken the back side of it, and I want to pack that the best I can with petroleum jelly. This will help my spring from coming out as I install it. Now it's just a matter of driving the seal down flush. I have a tool to do this, but you can use a large socket also. Another kit I decided to buy for this rebuild is a spring and roller kit for the low roller clutch in the bottom of the case. The springs get old and tend to break. And this is cheap insurance. And here's what it looks like when I have them correctly installed. Now notice the inner race only spins in one direction. And be sure to put a little bit of transmission fluid on this to lubricate it. 
Now as we assemble the rest of the transmission, I'll be using a lot of petroleum jelly on a lot of the parts. And what I did was just bought a cheap paintbrush, and I'll use this to paint it on the parts as we go. We'll start our assembly with our pump. Now to install the front seal, again, I packed petroleum jelly in around the spring. And notice, we don't want any petroleum jelly around the outside edge. Just lay the seal in, use a solid block of wood, and tap the seal down in. As you do this, don't forget about the vent on the back side of the pump if you have one. Now, I set it in the hole of my bench and that works out great. Next, I want to lubricate the front bushing and where the pump gears ride. And then I'll reinstall the pump gears. Remember I marked these to show which side went up in the beginning? I want to center this gear with the bushing. Then drop on the stator half. Now there's six bolts that hold our two pump halves together and they're three quarters of an inch long. Be sure to torque these to 150 inch pounds. Next, I'll put on my selective thrust washer here and I've chosen the thickest one I can to reduce my end ply. Then I'll install my steel rings from the kit. Now as you put these in the groove and lock these back together, make sure they spin freely. If they don't, look closely here. You may have to clean that up with a file. Sometimes the ring groove gets damaged. But make sure all your rings spin freely. Now on our forward clutch, you also need to replace the rings here. Some will have three and others will have two. Now if you had a locking type torque converter, the end of the shaft will be machined like this. This is for the non-locking converter style. And remember, you'll have the extra valve body piece with this shaft. Now if you look closely at the seals both in your kit and the ones you've removed, you'll find there's three types. First one here is just an O-ring style. The second one is a lip type seal. Now we've cut these in half to give you a good view. On this example, the lip is pointing down. And we'll refer to this as we install these lip seals. And of course, our square cut seal here on the end. Now you need to find the new lip seals for the forward clutch piston. There's one on the outside and one on the inside. Install these so the lip points down. You also need to lubricate inside the forward clutch drum itself. This eases the installation of the piston. One tool we'll need to aid this installation is simply called a lip seal installation tool. It's just a tube and it has two fine wires on each end to help us get the lip seal in. Now before I install the piston, I want to lubricate the seals also. So use plenty of petroleum jelly on the seals themselves. I'll set it in here. I'll use the wire on my tool to chase the inner and outer seals to get these started. Now this is not something you want to force. This should work easy and just take your time on it. When they're started, spin the piston and it pushes easily into the bore. Now the rest of this goes right back together the same way we took it apart. Drop the housing into the forward clutch drum. And then our return spring should lay right in there. The spacer on top of it and then we'll need our wave snap ring. Notice on this one that sits on top of that spacer how the ends are straight. Now the easiest way I've found to install this snap ring is start it on one side, hold the drum up, and use a screwdriver to tap it down into place. And just work this all the way around. Next, I'll install my pressure plate. That just drops right on top of the spring. And now I'm ready for my forward clutches. If you look at the two sets in the kit, the forward are the smoother ones, where the others will be checkered on the face. So I want to use the smoothest set for this clutch drum. 
Now to prepare these and the band for use, I want to soak these at least a half hour in a bucket of automatic transmission fluid. Just pour a quart in a bucket and let these soak. Now I'll begin stacking in my clutches. You'll want to make sure how many you took out of your drum because it does vary from year to year. And we'll start with a fiber clutch on the bottom, then a steel plate on top of that, and then a fiber clutch, and a steel plate. And I alternate these all the way to the top. And what I'll end up with is a fiber plate on the very top of my stack. And then install the pressure plate and the snap ring. With the clutch assembled, I must be certain that I have enough clutch end play here, how much room these clutches can move. And using a feeler gauge, I want to measure it just under the snap ring to the top pressure plate. I must have at least 20 thousandths of clearance here and no more than 45. The top snap ring comes in different thicknesses, so if I have to adjust it, I'll have to buy another snap ring. On the inside of the drum, I want to reinstall my thrust washer. Now most models use a round thrust washer. It could be bronze like this, or it may be a fiber washer. I just want to stick it in place there with some petroleum jelly. Some of the later model units will use a three-tab bronze thrust washer. We want to stick that into place the same way. On top of our clutch drum, you'll need to replace the fiber washer that sits here. Set it into some petroleum jelly. Now this is also the same thrust washer that sits behind that front pump. So if we need to, we can add a thicker one here to adjust the clearance. Also, be sure to lubricate all the rings on this shaft. For our direct drum, you'll need to replace the outer lip seal here on the piston. And again, this lip will face down and the lip seal inside the drum. Again, the lip faces down. It fits down into the groove. You'll have to stretch it around to fit, but make sure it's all the way in the groove. Again, lubricate the piston bore and the seals. This piston's a little different to install. Unlike the forward clutch, we can't get our tool at these seals. But unlike the forward clutch, the manufacturer uses a short lip design on these seals. And to install it, just use your thumbs and slowly rock the piston back and forth to start the seal. Spin it around and do the same here and keep working these seals slowly until the piston pushes all the way down into the bore. Now, just as we took it apart, you'll have to use your spring compressor to reinstall the springs, the retainer, and the snap ring. Our clutch installation starts with a steel down against the piston, and then alternate the clutch, steel, all the way to the top. Again, you'll have to keep track of how many clutches came out of this unit. But we'll always end up with a clutch on top. And then the pressure plate and the snap ring. This is the wave snap ring with the notch at the end. And again, just like the forward clutch, we're concerned about the clutch clearance. Use a feeler gauge again and measure this underneath the high spot on the wave of the snap ring. Now this measurement must be at least 50 thousandths and can be as much as 150 thousandths. For a smooth reverse, keep this at least 100 thousandths. Again, the snap ring is selective and we can get different snap rings to adjust it. With our pump and our third gear clutch complete, I want to air test this unit to make sure it's going to work. I'll use plenty of petroleum jelly on the rings and the bushing surface. Set the drum gently down on the pump all the way. Now to check this drum, all I need is a rubber tip blow nozzle. And I want to set it in this hole here of the pump. And this will apply our clutch drum. I'll make sure you get a good seal there and apply the air. Just a quick burst will do. See how long that takes to leak down? 
Now I want to do the same test on my forward clutch to make sure it's going to work. Drop it down into the pump and rotate it around until it drops all the way down into the clutches. When it's dropped all the way, you can push on it and it still turns. Now I'll just repeat the same process using this hole in the pump here and hold down firmly on this forward clutch. Now that's a nice air check of both of these drums. So why bother to air check? What this tells me is that my ceiling rings are working correctly, the new ones I put in. The surfaces where the rings ride are okay, and I did a good job on the inspection. The check balls in the drum and the piston are both working fine. Also, the lip seals I installed were installed correctly. This can save me a big headache before I install the transmission in the vehicle. Next, I'll reinstall my output shaft support into the case. This requires four bolts one inch long, and they should be torqued to 150 inch pounds. Next, I'll reinstall my governor with both valves on the output shaft. And I want to make sure to line up the hole for the pin, and then reinstall the pin with the clips. Next, reinstall the thin snap ring that holds our governor on, the thick one at the bottom of the bearing, if you have a bearing there, and notice which way this bearing goes on with the groove facing down, and the thick one on top of that bearing. Now we're ready to install our servos into the case. Now I'd like to show you a couple different gear variations. On the second gear servo, you could have an early one, and we haven't shown this one. It's just a cover, a spring, and a rod. It's a very simple setup. Now you don't want to interchange these servos because they are matched to your valve body. There's also an early reverse piston. And the breakdown looks like this. There's a small snap ring holding the top on and then a spring inside it. Again, these are not interchangeable. On the reverse servo, lube the bore and the seal as always. We install the piston, the spring, and the retainer. Now this spring is usually light enough, you can just use your thumb, push down, and reinstall that snap ring. On our second gear servo, it starts the same way. Drop the piston in. This will take a little work because it does have the steel rings. But do this gently. Never force this piston into the bore. When you have it centered, Wiggle around till it goes to the bottom of that bore. Installing the top on this servo is a little more difficult because the spring is so strong. I like to use a pair of vice grips, one like this with a big C channel. I'll get on one side of the case here and I'll just help it. I don't want to force it, I just want to help it down. When the piston's safely lower than the snap ring groove, I'll lock the pliers into place and then reinstall the snap ring. I'll be careful because these pliers can come off here. As I reinstall my reverse band, I want to make sure I rotate it until it securely fits onto the lug here. Now I'm ready to reinstall the band strut and I'll just slide it back down in there and with the adjuster out of the way, I should be able to put that in with my fingers. You can check your installation by lifting up on the apply arm and just watching the band. Next, I want to just start the adjuster screw in the hole here. Now I've applied petroleum jelly on the bushing surface of my reverse drum and I'll go ahead and install it. When it's seated in there correctly, it only spins one direction and the front of the drum here is about even with my output shaft support. Next, I'll lubricate my output shaft well and the rings on it, and then I'll install it in the back of the case. Then again, my rear ring gear and the thrust washer, I'll hold in place with plenty of petroleum jelly as with the rest of the thrust washers. Next is my rear planet carrier 
and the thrust washer. Now the sun gear and the shell with its thrust washer. For our front planet carrier and ring gear, don't forget the thrust washer here, but I want to put these two items together before I slide it down the output shaft. Because we're engaging into the gear and the shaft at the same time, you have to rotate these pieces to get it to drop in where it belongs. And next, I'll reinstall the snap ring on the output shaft. On our tail housing, we've cleaned off all the old gaskets and installed the new rear seal. With the new gasket installed and lined up correctly, it's time to reinstall my tail housing and again, I'll need my snap ring pliers to hold that snap ring open as I drop this down. Now you will notice as you set that down, the snap ring doesn't quite go into the snap ring groove. You'll have to use a screwdriver and lift up on the output shaft until it snaps into place. Then install the new gasket, the plates, and the screws. And be sure to tighten these as tight as you can by hand. You'll have six tail housing bolts, an inch and an eighth long. Be sure to torque these to 25 foot-pounds. Our particular model uses a steel washer on the output shaft here. Not all units will use this, and if you need additional shims for the end plate, you can always add one. Next, I'll install my forward and direct clutch drums. And to do this, I'll have to spin these around until the clutch is engaged. Notice how far the direct clutch drum sits inside our sun gear shell when it's properly installed. Now, if any time I want to check to make sure all my clutches are engaged, I just push down on the direct clutch drum and make sure I can still spin the forward clutch drum both ways. This ensures me that it's installed all the way. I'll install my pump gasket and my front pump. Now I've left out the second gear band and no O-ring on the pump at all. And I want to install this all the way in and I want to make sure to line up my bolt holes and then start two bolts, one across from each other and I'll tighten these down with just a speed wrench. Now, if both my drums are still in place, as soon as I feel these bolts snug up at all, I want to make sure the input shaft still turns freely. And if it does, then I know it's assembled correctly, and I'll go ahead and tighten these up fairly snug. Now, what we want to check is total unit end play. And that's how much the pieces inside this transmission can shift from end to end inside the transmission. Now I want to push the input shaft all the way back. I'll use a pair of vice grip pliers, or you could use a dial indicator. But this is a nice, simple way to do it. I want to make sure these are a nice pair of pliers with a good side to them. Now push that up as tight as I can to the stator itself. Also, make sure the input shaft's all the way back. Now once it's clamped on there, I'll pull it out. Then using my feeler gauge again, I want to measure how much room there is between the stator and my pliers. This figure will be our end play, and we must keep this between 20 to 50 thousandths. And remember, this is adjusted by using different thickness washers behind the pump and in between the forward and direct clutch drum. Now when I'm satisfied with the end play, I'll remove the pump and install my second gear band. Next, I'll reinstall the pump gasket and put the square cut seal on the outside pump. I want to make sure that I lubricate both the seal and the bore that the pump fits into. And I'll reinstall my pump. And be sure to check this the same way we did when checking end play. Just use two bolts to snug them down, make sure we can still turn that input shaft. Don't forget to put the new washers from your kit on the pump bolts and torque all these bolts to 175 inch-pounds. 
Now I've reinstalled my band adjusting screw. And notice on this second gear band, some of these are notched only on one side, so they'll only fit in that case one way. And here's a look at my struts reinstalled and my accumulator and spring. Be sure to use plenty of petroleum jelly on this piece. For our reverse band adjustment, I want to make sure the band moves freely on the drum and it's centered. And I'll tighten the screw down by hand until I find the movement of that arm is only 3 eighths of an inch when I pry on the arm with a screwdriver. Then I want to tighten that lock nut. And finally, make sure the adjustment isn't too tight by turning the output shaft and making sure the reverse drum still turns. Second gear band adjustment starts with reading the ratio on the band apply arm. Ours is a 2.9. With the lock nut backed off, I want to use a short wrench and just snug this band adjustment. Now if I have a ratio of 4.0 or less, I want to back this off two and a half times. If it's more than 4.0, I want to back it off two and a quarter times and then tighten down the lock nut securely. Now I've reinstalled the neutral safety switch and I'm ready for my valve body. Be sure to lubricate the shaft that goes through the seal. And now we'll have to install the park rod down into the linkage hole there. And I want to start the shaft through the hole in the case. Now I have to turn the output shaft in order to get the park linkage to drop in. Once it does, I can push the valve body down into place. The valve body bolts are an inch and an eighth long and need to be torqued to 100 inch pounds. Now I have three screws with the larger washers that held my filter on. And again, I'll just want to hand tighten these three screws. Now before you install your pan, you want to make sure that it's nice and straight. Usually they're dimpled out from over tightening at all the bolt hole locations. So take a hammer on a steel bench and tap these holes back. Make sure they're nice and flat, just like you would any valve cover. Our converter installation starts by lubricating the hub well and the front pump seal. I want to highly recommend replacing your torque converter with a rebuilt unit. After all, these are a sealed unit. I can't see what's going on inside or how much debris 